Well, here we go again, huh? Another year, another year in front of us, another opportunity. It's time for a, another list of resolutions. So how many have already made your resolutions for this year? Anybody made any uh, resolutions? Good. I guess, I, I guess we've decided we're not going to make them, right? Or, or else we don't want to. You know, I, I just looked for the fun of it the other day. I googled New Year's resolutions, and there were more than 50 million hits of New Year's resolutions. And I wanted to share, uh, here were some of the humorous ones that I found online. New Year's resolution number one, be more awesome than last year. How many of us can relate to that? You can probably relate to that. You probably said back, thought I was awesome last year. I just want to be more awesome this next year. Here's another one. My New Year's resolution is to stop putting my foot in my mouth all the time. I bet yours is losing weight, huh? I thought that was, I thought that was humorous. You'll, you'll get that in a second. Um, my wife challenged me to make New Year's resolutions I can keep, so I'm determined and committed to become fatter, lazier, and older this year. I thought, boy, I can, I can relate with that one. That's for sure. I loved uh, this list. I think there was one more. Is there one more? I love this list. New Year's resolutions, and the person has just changed it every year. In 2011, it was lose weight, and then it was lose weight again, lose more weight, get fit next year, give up alcohol, cigarettes, drink. It's like every time they couldn't accomplish it, so they kind of crossed, crossed it out and made it just a little bit easier. I love number five, be nicer to my wife, and then it try, becomes try to be nicer to my ex-wife there. Um, all of us, I'm sure, have experience uh, making uh, resolutions, and all of us resolve uh, as we begin a new year to make certain changes uh, at the beginning of the year, and quite frankly, most of those time, most of the time, those changes only last a few weeks. I, I was reading this week, and I, I related so much with, uh, with, with the gentleman that said, last year, I resolved to lose 10 pounds, only 15 pounds to go. <laughs> I thought, I thought that was funny. That's me. You know, last year I was going to lose 10 pounds, and uh, now I have to lose 15 to hit where I was going to be uh, last year. The simple truth is this, though. God desires for us to change. God desires for me to change. God desires for you to change. Here's the other truth, though. As much as we need to change, we can't do it. I can't change. You can't change on our own. It's impossible for us to change ourselves. It's why we make the same New Year's resolutions year after year. It's why probably next year, unless God does a work in our life, we're going to be in the same situation 362 days from now as we are at this moment. The simple truth is I can't change me and you can't change you. It doesn't matter how resolved we are. It doesn't matter how determined we are. Real change is only something that God accomplishes through us. I want to read just one verse today, a verse that, that you know, but I kind of want us to, to kind of use it as a basis this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. If you have your Bibles, turn with me there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to bounce around this morning. Our message is going to be a little bit different. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. The Apostle Paul says this. We'll put it up on the screen if you don't have a Bible with you. Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Notice what he says. The old has passed away. Behold, the new is come. Uh, what is Paul talking about? He's talking about the fact that, that God desires to produce a change in your life and in mine. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is a, is a wonderful chapter. Quite frankly, I probably use this chapter more at the graveside of a believer than at any other time. Because in this chapter, the Apostle Paul talks about the temporariness, and yes, that is a word, I looked it up, all right? The temporariness of our physical bodies, and he talks about the permanence of our soul and our spirits. 
If you have your Bible open in chapter 5, verse 2, the same chapter, Paul says this, For in this tent, speaking about our bodies, in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Let me ask you, how many groaned when you got out of bed this morning? All right? I groaned when I got out of bed. I mean, it's like, okay, God, I'm ready. I'm ready for a new body, one that doesn't creak, one that doesn't hurt, one that doesn't get so tired. In verse 8 of that chapter, Paul says, yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Well, as we walk through this chapter and as we look at the context, Paul makes a, a great statement that we've read that is found in verse 17. And, and he says, the truth being that God alone is the one who changes us. God alone is the one who takes this physical body and transforms it into a spiritual body. God alone is the one who takes us from this life and transforms us to the life to come. And God alone is the one who changes us right now. Even while we're in this physical body, it is God and God alone who changes us. So, so I want you to see this verse once again. We'll put it back up on the screen. Verse 17, and I want to read it slowly today, all right? And, and follow along with me. Notice Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ. So who's he referring to? Talking about believers. Uh, people who have trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Been forgiven of their sins. Their home is in heaven. They now have a future. If anyone is in Christ, notice what he says. He is... A new creation. All right, no, uh, no maybes, no, no perchances there. What does he say? He says, if you're in Christ, you are what? You are a new creation. Here's the idea. What, what God begins, God always finishes. Catch that. Brian starts a lot of things. I have a lot of tasks that I've started at the house that I haven't finished. Brian starts them, Vicky finishes them. That's the way the Burkholder household works, all right? But, but here's the thing. God never stops what he starts. And so if, if God began a new work in you, and God began a new work in me, he is going to finish it. Now, let's put it back up on the screen. What, so what does that entail? That says this. Old things are passed away. Uh, what does old things refer to? Uh, keep it up, uh, if you don't mind. Um, what, what does that refer to? It, it refers to our old way of living, the way we used to talk, the way we used to think, the way we used to act, the way we used to treat our spouse, the way we used to do this and that. That, that old way of living is what? Present tense verb is what? It's past Away. So, so let me just pause for a second and say this. If this morning you say, I am in Christ, but that old way of living has not passed away in your life. If you are still living today as you lived before you were a believer, you had better do a gut check. You'd better do a spiritual check. Because God changes us. And, and if I am not being changed, now the change is not instantaneous. It's not like, you know, you know, one day I was a non-believer and today I'm a believer and man, I don't sin anymore. But if God is not effectuating a change in your life, if you cannot begin to say, boy, thank God I used to do that and I don't do that anymore. Thank God I used to speak that way and I don't speak that way anymore. Thank God I used to think like that and I don't think that way anymore. If that is not happening in your life, you better check your life. Because Paul says, if you are in Christ, you are a new creation. And old things have passed away. And all things have become new. Here's what I want you to catch today. In this new year, God desires to change you. In this new year, God desires to change me. As I mentioned, it's not something that you and I can do on our own, but it certainly is something that God can do in us. Here's my challenge 
to you, my challenge to me this year. This is a new year. Let Jesus change your life. This is a new year. Become a new you. Allow God to change you. Now listen, it doesn't matter where you are in the spiritual spectrum, none of us get to the place that we don't need to change anymore. You, you, you know, you might be sitting around saying, oh my word, my Brian, I hope these people are listening to what you're saying. All right? Listen, you need to be listening to what I'm saying. I need to be listening to what I'm saying. Because I'm telling you right now, Brian needs a change in his life. You need a change in your life, and God wants to effectuate that change. This morning's message is going to be a little different. I know we're very exegetical, very expositional in the way we teach, and, and, and we don't make apologies for that, and we're going to be that again beginning next week. We're, we're starting a brand new series called Flipped, in which we're going to go through the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to see how God wants to flip your life, and God wants to transform your life. But today, I, I just kind of want to be really practical. First Sunday of the year. I just want to share just a few practical truths with you, something that God has laid on my heart, a few steps that I'm confident if you take and if I take, God will do something different in our lives. Would you pray with me one more time? Lord, this morning we humbly come before you. We realize that um, not only is your faithfulness great, But as Jeremiah said, your mercies are new every single morning. Great is your faithfulness. Thank you for a new year. Thank you for a new opportunity, a new chance. Thank you that you're a God of second, third, fourth, and fifth chances. And God, as we begin this new year, I pray you'd help us to be honest with ourselves. Help our ears to be in tune to the Holy Spirit of God. And Lord, I pray that you would accomplish in our lives what you desire to accomplish. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. One of my ministerial heroes is a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards. How many have ever heard of Jonathan Edwards? Several of you have heard of Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was born on October 5th, 1703. I know that was a long time ago. I put that birth date up for one reason. He and I share a birthday. I'm born on October 5th, all right? Write that down in your Bibles. You might want to remember that date, all right? He was born October 5th, 1973. Jonathan Edwards entered Yale College at the age of 13. He graduated from Yale uh, three years later at the age of 16 as the valedictorian of his class. By the age of 18, he had already finished a master's degree. And by the age of 19, he was in the ministry. He was born to a family of pastors. His dad was a pastor. His grandfather was a pastor. His grandfather pastored Northampton Church in England, one of the most influential churches in all of England, a church that Jonathan Edwards would later pastor. At the age of 24, he was associate pastor of that same church. In 1729, his grandfather died, and at the age of 26, Jonathan Edwards became the pastor of Northampton Church. You probably heard of him because he and George Whitfield were the catalyst behind the Great Awakening. You say, Brian, what is the Great Awakening? It's probably the last revival that we've experienced in the United States of America. And he and Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield preached powerful messages that God used in our country to bring our country to its knees. At the age of 38, he preached his most famous sermon. You've probably heard of it, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, a message that has um, been read and, and heard, or I guess not heard because it wasn't recorded, but read over and over again. He, I, I, I'd encourage you, go to, the, go to Google, Google in Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It's in Old English, but it's well worth reading. He goes through and he talks about the fact that God may cast man into hell at any moment. He talks about the fact that the wicked deserve to be cast into hell. And divine justice does not prevent God from destroying the wicked. Historians say that when Jonathan Edwards stood and preached that message, that it was so convicting that men and women literally held on, gripped the backs of their pews at that time under such conviction 
They say that men wept and people cried out in repentance towards God. And wouldn't it be great if we experienced something like that in our country? Wouldn't it be great if we experienced something like that in our church? Jonathan Edwards is considered one of the most intellectual persons that has ever been produced, has ever been born on the North American continent. But here's why I mention him to you today. At the age of 19, Jonathan Edwards composed 70 life resolutions. I have them here. We're not going to read them. (laughs) Once again, you can find them. He composed as a 19-year-old. He sat down and he composed, and I didn't write them all at one setting. He wrote 22 of them the first time, and then throughout the next year, he wrote the rest of the 70 resolutions that he determined would forever guide his life. And he made the determination that he not only would write these 70 resolutions, but he would read through them, he would pray through them at least once or twice a week. And so for the rest of his life, Jonathan Edwards read and lived by these resolutions. I'm not going to take the time and read them today, but I would encourage you to do so. Listen, here's where I'm going this morning. I believe that Jonathan Edwards was powerfully used by God, not because of his education, not because of his intellectual mind. And, and I mean, he's read, written some stuff that's way beyond my ability to comprehend. God used him not because of his education, not because of his intellectual mind, not because of his oratory ability, nor because of his influence. But I believe that God used him because Jonathan Edwards resolved to allow God to change him. He resolved. It was his life's determination to allow God to work in his life. So with Jonathan Edwards' resolutions as a backdrop to the message today, and I'm going to mention a few of them, and with the Word of God as our guide, let me just mention several extremely practical truths today, things that as a pastor I want to I want to challenge you. I want to challenge our church. I want to challenge myself this year. And if we will take these steps, I believe with all of my heart that there's no doubt that God will change us. Okay, you ready? The first thing I wrote down is this. Your goal should be to glorify God above everything else. Let me say that again. I want that to kind of ease in. Your goal My goal should be to glorify God above everything else. That should be the number one priority in my life and the number one priority in your life. Glorifying God is more important than weight reduction. (laughs) Glorifying God is more important than anger control. Glorifying God is more important than time management. Glorifying God is more important than being organized. Glorifying God is more important than financial success. Whatever you and I would list as as our theoretical goals for this year, above everything else that we determine to do this year, glorifying God should be the guiding principle of our life. It was with Jonathan Edwards. His very first resolution in that list of 70 was this. I'll put it up on the screen. I won't read the whole thing. Resolved that I will do whatsoever I think to be most to the glory of God and to my own good very first resolution. I want to glorify God. By by the way, Jonathan Edwards wasn't the first person to mention that. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, which the church used for years, which was written in 1647, is a list of questions, doctrinal questions, and then doctrinal answers. And so the Westminster Shorter Catechism says this, the very first question, I think we have it, is what is the chief end of man? And in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, they said this, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. What does the Bible say? 
1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. The apostle Paul says this. So whether you eat or drink. Let me pause. The most mundane, common things of life. I have no idea what you're going to do today, but I guarantee you that all of us are going to what? Eat and drink. Now, you're probably going to eat and drink and sleep or something like that. But but here's what Paul says. Whether you eat or drink in the most common things of life, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. So what is Paul saying? Glorifying God is more important than anything else in your life. It's more important than anything else in my life. You say, Brian, what does it mean to glorify God? To glorify God means to bring him honor. To glorify God means to make God look good. To glorify God means to point people to him through our words and through our actions. Let me give you a simple illustration that I'm going to ask Matt Kelly to come up here. Come on up here, Matt. We're glad to have Matt home from from Moody Bible Institute. And uh, Matt today is going to be Jesus. Doesn't Matt look like Jesus this morning? Uh Uh-huh. I had to tell him because when I asked Matt to be Jesus, I really thought if you'd know Matt that he'd come dressed in a long flowing robe and, and something like that. And I said, just, just be your normal self. So let me kind of illustrate what, what I'm talking about today. So, so our goal in life should be what? Now, 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 don't look at Matt. This is Jesus, all right? Our goal in life should be to what? To glorify him. So, so, so everything I do, should be done for the purpose of glorifying him. Let me illustrate. If we can cut our house lights, cut our house lights for, for, for just a second. Let's cut all of the house lights, all right? Now, we have a tendency to do two things, all right? We have a tendency to live in such a way that there's no light shining. It's just kind of dark. We go to work, we're at our house, and we live. We say things we shouldn't. We act as if we shouldn't. We do all of that, and there's no light shining because it's just us. Or we have a tendency to live and act in such a way that the spotlight is on us. All right? It's all about us. Whatever I'm doing, whether I'm ministering or whatever I'm doing, it's about me. I want the spotlight on me. But that's not what it means to glorify God. To glorify God means that the light is always on Him. It's always on Jesus. It doesn't matter what I'm doing in life. He is lit up in my life. He is glorified. He is honored. And so in my actions, what happened? Jesus is lit up in my actions as I respond, as I interact with people. They don't see me, but they see who? They see Jesus. My my service, it's not about me. And so as I stand and speak, or as I stand and sing, or as as I serve here, it's not about me. The spotlight, the glory, the honor is never on me. It's always on who? It's always on Jesus. My dress, as a believer, I should dress in such a way that I, I don't bring attention to myself, but, but the spotlight isn't on me. It's on whom? It's on Jesus. I manage my finances in such a way that it doesn't glorify me, but who does it glorify? It glorifies Jesus. This year, glorifying Jesus should be the most important thing in our life. Let's give Matt a hand. He did a great job playing Jesus, huh? It was was difficult. Could you imagine? Imagine with me today what would happen if all of us here this morning, 400, 420 people, if all of us here this morning determined that in 2016, our chief aim, the most important thing that we are going to do is to glorify Jesus. What would happen? 
What would happen if, if you made that your ultimate goal? What would happen if, if I made that my ultimate goal? Well, well, first of all, here's what would happen. You would change. I would change. But not only that, he, here's what else is going to happen. There's going to be kind of a trickle-down effect. Your marriage is going to change. It's going to change. Your, your families are going to change. Your community is going to change. Our city would change. If we just sat back this year and said, okay, God, in everything I do, I want to honor and glorify you. Can I encourage you this morning to make a filter in your life? A filter in everything you say, everything you do, everywhere you go, every way that that you manage your household, every way that you manage your finances, every way that you manage your time. You filter everything through that question. Does this bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. You see, church, the simple truth is this. You and I were created for one reason and one reason alone. We weren't created to be successful. We weren't created for relationships as as important as all of those things are. The most important reason why you and I were created was to bring glory to him for the light to shine on him, to be taken away from me and to shine on him. Let me encourage you to do that this year. Let me mention a second thing today. The second thing is this. You and I should make life resolutions instead of temporary resolutions. We should make life resolutions instead of temporary resolutions. Now, now, now we're excellent at focusing on the temporary and ignoring the eternal. That's why so many people live their entire lives and they're not ready to die because they focus on the immediacy of life. We're experts at that. We focus on the now, the here and now, and we kind of put out of our minds the future, all right? Uh, We emphasize the external over the internal. To us, the external is, is more important. And quite frankly, that makes no sense whatsoever. Would you, would you paint a car that doesn't run? <laughs> if I give you a car that didn't run and you look at it and say, boy, that car needs a good paint job. I'm going to spend $1,000 painting that car. If it doesn't run, you're not going to do it. Why? It makes no sense to work on the external unless the internal is in order. Amen. We have a tendency to put a lot more focus on the external than we do on the internal. Uh -uh. We make temporary resolutions instead of making life-changing resolutions. The Apostle Paul said this in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Paul says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my one aim, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward for what lies ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That that wasn't a a New Year's resolution of Paul. It wasn't, you know, the year, you know, 49, you know, getting ready to celebrate the year 50. And Paul sits back and says, okay, what am I going to do this year? There's one thing I do, forgetting that which is behind and pressing towards that which is before. The year 50, that's what I'm going to do. Now, this was a this was a life time determination of the Apostle Paul. Paul says, the focus of my life is to press towards the goal, the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So, so let me help us out just a little bit today. What are, what are some things that, that we can do this year that would help us to be focused on the eternal and not the temporary? What are some things that we can do this year that will focus more on the internal than on the external? I told you I'm going to be extremely practical. Four very simple things today. I didn't put them in your notes. You can write them down. But let me encourage you. Determine to spend time in God's Word every single day. 
Determined to spend time in God's Word every day. You know, statistics say that it's absolutely embarrassing how many, how little time Christians spend in their Bible. If I asked you, if I took a microphone around and I asked you to be honest, and I said, okay, let's, let's begin. How much time average do you spend every day in God's Word? I think we would be shocked at the little time that we spend reading God's Word. What would happen if we allowed God's Word to saturate our mind? If we allowed God's Word to saturate our hearts? Jonathan Edwards said this, his 28th resolution was, resolved to study the Scriptures so steadily, constantly, and frequently, as that I may find and plainly perceive myself to grow in the knowledge of the same. You say, Brian, what in the world does that mean? Here's what, here's what he said in modern English. I want to study the Scriptures so much that it's evident that my knowledge of the Word has increased. Listen, life change will not happen apart from the Word of God. Life change will not happen apart from the Word of God. Did you catch that? might be the most important thing I say all day long. Life change will not happen apart from the Word of God. You know why you're not changing? Because you're not exposing yourself to the Word of God. You have to allow the Word of God to saturate your mind, to saturate your hearts, so that it can become the catalyst and the help for, that you and I need to change and to overcome sin. Here's what David said in Psalm 119, verse 11. I have stored your Word in my hearts, that I might not sin against you. I have stored your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I remember at the age of 21, I graduated from high school, oh, excuse me, not high school, man, I wasn't. <laughs> graduated from college at 21. A little bit of a slow learner there. Um, graduated from college at the age of 21. Three weeks later, I was ordained into ministry, and three days later, Vicki and I were married. And uh, yeah, yeah, what, what a month, huh? And, uh, but I remember at my ordination, you know, this 21-year-old kid, and these pastors are coming around me, laying their hands on me, ordaining me to the gospel ministry. At the age of 21, I had Reverend Brian Burkholder in front of my name. I thought I was something, I'm telling you. I mean, and, and I remember thinking, Man, as soon as I'm ordained, it's going to be so easy for me to overcome temptation. I mean, I'm, I'm an ordained minister. I mean, you know, the devil's going to see me and run. He's just going to run when he sees me. Why wouldn't he? I'm Reverend Brian Burkholder. And, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to wake up the next morning, and there's just going to be this unbelievable desire in my heart, an insatiable desire in my heart to read God's Word because now I'm a reverend. I'm Reverend Brian Burkholder. And guess what happened? The next day I woke up and nothing changed. <laughs> the same things that I was tempted with before I became a reverend, I was tempted with after, and I might even say maybe just a little bit stronger. The, the same lack of desire that I had to spend time in God's Word and to spend time in prayer before I became a professional pastor, I had after I became a, pre, a professional pastor, if there is such a thing as a professional pastor. All right? Here's what I'm saying. There's only one thing that will change you. It's not a title. It's not accomplishment. It's not maturity. It's not surrounding yourself by the right people. It's not turning over a new leaf. There is only one thing that will change you, and it's God's Word. And I, and I promise you this, 
if this year you spend as little time in God's Word as you spent this past year, you'll be the exact same 362 days from now. You'll be the exact same. And a year from then, you'll be the exact same thing. The only thing that will change you is God's Word. Yeah, yeah, you know... As pastors, we sit back, and obviously we have a lot of discussions, and there's discussions on the Internet, but Christianity has changed so much in the last 50 years. It's changed so much, and, and, and that's a discussion for a different day. But one of the main changes is this. 50 years ago, believers weren't near as distracted as we are today. And believers spent so much more time in God's Word than they do today. We have churches that are filled with biblically illiterate people. That's not what God intended for you and me. The creator of the universe wrote a book for you to read and for me to read. Listen, determine this year things are going to change because this year, I am going to spend time in God's word. And I'm telling you now, tighten your seatbelts, all right? You're in for an unbelievable ride. Because not only is God going to teach you, but it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to do. And you've got to be disciplined to study God's word. But I promise you this, it is worth it. It's worth it. Husbands, you want to be a, a husband that loves your wife like you should and honors your wife like you should? Spend time in the Word of God. Wives, do you want to be the type of wife that loves your husband and supports your husband and, and uh, is able to be the type of mother that God wants you to be? Spend time in the Word of God. Parents, you want to be the example for your kids that you ought to be? Hey, hey here's a radical idea. I know it's going to seem absolutely crazy. Turn off the television and open your Bible. Listen, I'm not crazy. I'm not saying throw the thing out. I'm not saying that. But, but, but I'm saying this. If, if you spend five times, seven times, ten times more time in front of the television or in front of the Internet than in front of God's Word, your life will not change. Determine, determine to spend time in God's Word. I, I, I could keep going, but I won't. Here's the second thing. Determine to dedicate your life to prayer. Uh, Jonathan Edwards' 29th resolution said this resolved, never to count that a prayer, nor to let that pass as a prayer, nor that a petition of prayer, which is not so made that I cannot hope that God will answer it, nor that as a confession, which I cannot hope that God will uh, accept. Here's, here's what Jonathan was just saying. Listen, I want prayer to be real to me. I, I, I want to pray believing that God is going to answer something. When I ask and I confess my sin, I want to believe that God is forgiving me of my sin. And I want, to, I want to relish in that forgiveness because I've prayed and God answered. Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Hey, church, can I, can I be transparent with you today? Here's the one thing Brian needs this year. I, I don't know what you need in your life. I don't know what the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to you about. But I do know what I need in my life. And, and I'm telling you transparently today, I need to spend more time in prayer. I do. I know that. I know I should. I don't know why I don't. I had, I had this, the, this conversation with God the other day, and I'm asking him, God, how come I don't spend more time in prayer? Is it because I don't believe that you'll answer? And I'm like, no, I believe that you're going to answer. Is it because I'm self-sufficient, and I don't think that I need you? And, and I, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's what it is, but, I, but I'm telling you this. The same thing I'm telling God is this. I need to spend more time in prayer. I desperately need it in my life. I desperately need it in my family. I read this. A pastor friend of mine said this yesterday. When you pray to God regularly, irregular things happen on a regular basis. Think about that for a second. When you pray to God regularly, irregular things happen on a regular 
basis. Here's the simple truth. If nothing irregular is happening in your life, you're not spending enough time in prayer. If nothing irregular is happening in my life, I'm not spending enough time in prayer. Here's the third thing that I wrote down. You'd expect this, and man, time got away. Determined to be more connected to the body of Christ. Determined, don't disconnect. Oh my word, we live in a day and age in which people are disconnecting. Don't disconnect. Hebrews 10, 25, don't neglect gathering yourself together with unbelievers. Here's the fourth one. I gotta, I gotta move on. The fourth one is this, determined to join a life group. Determined to be a part. You've heard us say it all the time. Real growth, real fellowship, real service take place in a life group. It's in a, it, it's in a group of like-minded believers that we find accountability. It's in a group of like-minded believers that we study the word of God together and we grow together. It's in a group of like-minded believers that we find encouragement on those days that we're discouraged. Let me encourage you, join a life group. Be a part of a group of people that are growing together in their walk with the Lord. Can I, for just a second, can I ask all of our life group leaders around the auditorium, would you stand for just a second? If you lead a life group, any of our ministries on Wednesday or during the week, would you stand for just a second? Listen, we have life groups. These are just part of them. If you don't belong to a life group, run to one of these people afterward, all right? Let me encourage you. This year, you, you say, Brian, why is that? Listen, I, to me, it's not about numbers growing, all right? To me, it's about you growing. It's about me growing. I need to be a part of a life group. I'm a part of a life group that meets on a regular basis. Why do I do that? Because I'm a pastor? No, I do it because I need it. I need it in my life. And, and you do too. Listen, this year, make some life resolutions not temporary ones, life ones that'll change you. Let me mention the last thing, and I'm done. You and I must depend completely on the Holy Spirit of God. We must depend completely. The, the fact is that we cannot do anything apart from the grace of God and apart from his enablement. He is the one that produces change in our life. Let, let me show you verses. I want to read a few verses, and then we're going to end in a unique way today. Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16, the Apostle Paul says this. Galatians 5, but I say, walk by the Spirit. Depending on the translation, there might be a different preposition there. Walk by the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. He doesn't say, attend church every Sunday and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, even though I want you to attend church every Sunday. He says what? Walk in the Spirit, and then you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 17 says this. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do, that you want to do. Here's what's happening. There's a constant battle in your life and mine. All right? You, you, you know the commercial? You have the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other. Well, hey, ro hey, no devil, no angel. But here's what's happened. You have a sinful nature inside of you that is constantly battling all right? And you have the Holy Spirit of God that's in you as well. And there's a constant tug of war that's going on within you, all right? It's going on within me. Verse 18, if we can continue reading. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, keep reading, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, verse 21, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and with its lust. You see, the fact of the matter is this. It is only when you realize that you can't 
that you can. It is only when you surrender that you win. It's only when you give up and give in that God gives you the strength to do it. The only way that I'm going to change, the only way that you're going to change is to surrender, to realize this year I need to depend on the Holy Spirit of God. So so I want to end in a really unique way today, all right? Kim's going to come out and and just play something on the piano. I think Kim's going to come out and just play something on the piano. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to, I I don't want to manipulate you this morning. I I, I don't want to put an emotional guilt trip on you today. Here's what I want to happen. For the next two or three minutes, I want you to sit back and listen to the Holy Spirit of God. Each of us are different. What does God want you to do this year? What needs to change in your life this year? What needs to change that only God can change? Listen, I've spent a lot of time this week asking myself that same question. And God's done a little bit of work on Brian's life this week. All right? I'm sure that God has things that he wants to do in your life as well. Will you allow him to speak to you? So here's, we're going to take just a few minutes. It's just you and God. You say, Brian, silence is awkward. I know it is. Allow the awkwardness of silence to allow you to listen to the Holy Spirit as he tells you what you need to change. I put in your, in your outline today, this is just for you. You're not going to turn it in. My life resolutions that I make on January 3rd, 2016. Listen, allow the Holy Spirit of God to speak to you and you spend some time asking him, God, what do you want me to change? And when he tells you, write it down. Make that your change. Let's just spend some time in introspection and contemplation today. Lord, we need you this year. Lord, we needed you last year. Please forgive our self-sufficiency. Please forgive our self-dependence. Help us to realize that only you can produce change in our lives. And God, I pray that this year you would do a work in my life. I pray that you do a work in the Burkholder family. Pray that you do a work at Hollywood Community Church that only you 
can do. Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you would make us willing to surrender to you. I pray that you'd give us a hunger and a thirst for the word of God, a hunger and a thirst for you. Change us, change us to such a degree that our spouses notice a difference in our life. Change us to such a degree that our kids notice a difference in our life, that our coworkers notice a difference in our life. Oh God, this new year, make a new me. This new year, make a new us. God, I pray that Jesus would transform us this year. Do a work of grace in our lives, in our church, that only you can do. And we promise to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.